Hello, welcome everyone. Um, this session is ar around the CNCF cloud, uh, sorry, the CNCF storage tag, um, which deals with all stuff storage in the CNCF landscape. My name is Alex Kirkop. Uh, I'm a, a product architect in Akamai, and these are my two colleagues, uh, Jing. Hi, I'm Xin Yang. I work at VMware in the cloud native storage team. Also co-chair uh, with uh, Alex on their tech storage and also uh, co-chair in the Kubernetes 6 storage. And Raffaele Spazzoli, um, consulting architect at Red Hat. Great. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we want to use the session to talk a little bit about the tag and what we're doing. Um, some of the some background around cloud native storage and then we want to go through um, some of the documents and some of the community work that we're doing around the projects as well as um, our white papers that we've been working on which would which would all like to finish off this presentation with maybe a few uh, volunteers that might want to help with our uh, growing community so um, a little bit about, about TAG storage. So TAG stands for um, Technical Advisory Group. Um, they used to be called CNCF SIGs a couple of years back when they were first created. Um, our, call, our calls are bi-monthly um, on the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. Uh, they're all um, open to the public, so please join if you're interested in this space. Um, and all of our minutes and recordings and the mailing list uh, is, is also public. And again, please join if you want to join the community. Um, who are we? Uh, we have a number of, each tag has a number of um, uh, co-chairs uh, and tech leads, um, as well as a broader set of vendors and end users uh, who, who join the community. And we're supported by uh, our TOC liaison, so TOC is the, is the group that kind of makes the technical decisions within the CNCF. Uh, and at the moment, that's uh, Aaron Boyd. Um, so what do we do? We're, the, the concept behind the tag was to help the CNCF scale, right? We have an ever-growing list of projects and technologies as part of the ecosystem. Um, and we're here in, in, in helping to provide um, uh, SME capabilities, specifically in the storage space, uh, to, to, to the CNCF. So effectively, we do a, a number of different things. Um, one of the key things that, we try to do, that we're trying to do is to help um, educate and provide content for end users looking to adopt storage in, in a cloud native way. We also help the TOC in reviewing projects and, um, uh, and going through the due diligence process to allow projects to move from sandbox to incubation and, and finally to graduate. Um, we work with the community in sessions like this and with our calls. Um, and finally, we, we, we provide that subject matter expertise in the, in the storage space for, for, for the TOC. There are a number of, um, there are a number of projects which um, form part of the storage landscape within the CNCF. Um, some of these are very big projects which you're going to be, which you will already be using on a day-to-day -day basis, things like um, etcd. Um, others like, like Rook provide an object store, Vitesse is a distributed database, Harbor is um, a container registry and, and TIKV is a distributed key value store as well. Um, and we also have a number of incubating projects like uh, Dragonfly, QFS, and Longhorn, um, which are providing those, which, which, are, which are going through the process for graduation. On top of that, there are a whole, um, uh, there's a whole suite of sandbox projects. Um, I think in total there are maybe 80 sandbox projects today. Um, and, and it would be good uh, to have a look at the Sandbox Projects folder on that link um, to, to have a look at some of the pro projects which are looking for a community and looking for end users uh, to help join them. Um, so we spoke about Sandbox incubation and graduation. Um, you, some of you might be familiar with this, but I thought it would be useful to just kind of go through um, some of those levels and, 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 and kind of explain what we mean by that. So. Um, sandbox projects are the projects which have the lowest bar for entry um, and the idea here is to help foster, um, to help use the resources of the CNCF to help foster those communities and those projects um, so er projects in their early stages can look 
um, to, to help build uh, adoption, help build their governance, help with um, their, their IP and, and, and licensing and things like that. Um, from sandbox, we move into incubation. Incubation is, is probably the, the, almost the hardest uh, level to, to achieve in, in the CNCF projects because incubation has quite a high bar. Uh, a project which is in, in incubation is, is there for um, use in production and it's stable and, and, and has a lot of requirements in that respect. And therefore, um, the bulk of the due diligence that we do is on projects moving into incubation. And we look at things like um, their successful use in production. We look at end users um, who, are, who are using them and, 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 and interview them. Um, and we look at, at you know, healthy um, uh, project metrics, you know, as in the growth and, and the governance of, of those systems. Um, graduation is one is the last final step, and that and those are for projects um, like uh, Kubernetes and NetCD, for example, which also go through additional security audits and have uh, committers from multiple organisations, for example, to help show the, the final step of maturity. Um, so, we're talking about cloud native storage. Why should we be thinking about cloud native storage? Isn't it a fact that all containers are stateless? Well, there's no such thing as a stateless application. Um, every application is going to be storing state somewhere, whether it's a database, a file system, a key value store. And then the question is, do you run those, those stateful parts of your workloads, those stateful parts of your application together with the rest of your um, cloud native application, or do you run it outside of your cloud native application? And of course, you know, we, we, we argue that um, having cloud native storage within, uh, having the storage or the stateful workloads as part of your cloud native workflow gives you the, the, the automation and the scale and the performance and, 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 the, and the health and checking and failover that's kind of built into all of the, all of the patterns and architecture that you've been using for, for cloud native. So, you know, why go through the process of having uh, run books and workflow and CI, CD and security scanning for your cloud native and a different set of processes for, um, for your databases and key value stores and message queues, etc. Um, and the reality is now there's, there's a huge, incredible broad ecosystem with CSI support and standards for uh, implementing volumes of all types and, and stateful storage of all types um, within your cloud native environments. There are possibly 150 different CSI drivers, maybe. I think there might even be more. Um, and also, apart from that, what we're now seeing is um, a very healthy and mature ecosystem around operators for databases and message queues and everything else. So if you want to run Postgres, Mongo, um, RabbitMQ, and, and a variety of different other systems, all of those, all of those um, are, are simple options which can be now implemented declaratively with automated um, upgrades and failovers and data operations within your cloud native environments. So in order to, um, in order to help uh, people along and understanding this. We, we put together our first storage white paper a couple of years ago and, and Jing is going to take us through some of that. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, so I will talk about our storage landscape white paper. In this white paper, we talked about storage system attributes. We talked about the different layers or stacks of our storage solution and how they would impact the storage system attributes. We talked about the definitions of data access interfaces and management interfaces. Storage system have attributes. Here we have availability, uh, scalability, performance, co consistency, and durability. And availability refers to the ability to access data during failure conditions. This can be measured by the uptime as a percentage of availability. And scalability can be measured by the ability uh, to scale by the number of clients, the number of operations, the throughput, the capacity, and the number of components. Performance can be measured against latency, uh, number of operations per seconds, um, throughput. 
Consistency refers to the ability to access newly created data or updates that is already committed, that can be uh, eventually consistent, or it can be strongly consistent. For strongly consistent, it is uh, synchronous. Uh, if it's eventual consistency, then that's async. And we have a durability that is affected by the data protection layer, the level of redundancy, and the uh, endurance of the stored media, and the ability to detect corruption and recover from it. And we have different uh, storage layers that would affect those uh, storage attributes. This includes host and operating system, the storage topology, data protection layer, additional data services provided by a storage solution, and finally, the physical non-volatile layer. That's all I want to cover for the storage landscape by paper. Now I want to move to a new initiative that we are working on. We are collaborating with Data on Kubernetes community to write a white paper to describe the patterns of running data on Kubernetes. So in the first version of the white paper, we will be focusing on databases. However, most of the things we describe in that paper will apply to other type of uh, data workloads as well. In the paper, we talk about storage system attributes, how they would affect running data in Kubernetes, and we compare running data inside versus outside of Kubernetes, and we describe some of the common patterns and the features used while running data in Kubernetes. So we have a draft paper out. Please help review the paper. We have a link there. So I talked earlier that there are storage system attributes, and those apply to data running data in Kubernetes as well. And we added uh, a couple more attributes here, observability and elasticity. So for uh, cloud-native workloads, in cloud-native environment, we have uh, very di many different microservices running in a distributed fashion. And if uh, something happens, it's hard to determine which component is causing the problem. So it is even more important to have a comprehensive uh, ob observability system built in so that we can detect problem early and prevent the failure from happening. And elasticity refers to the ability to quickly scale up and down. Uh, and this can be referred to as a on-demand infrastructure. It can refer to the ability to release resources quickly when it is no longer needed. It can refer to storage tiering. Uh, so we can move data across different storage tiers based on how often the data is accessed. And uh, I mentioned earlier that there are different storage stacks that could affect the storage system attributes, and that is also true for running data in Kubernetes. And regarding disaster recovery, Rafael will talk about that later. We have options to run data inside or outside of Kubernetes. Deploying and operating Databases without proper automation is a legacy pattern that is not recommended. So there are mainly two options left. There are management, uh, manage the database services provided by most cloud providers. And you can also run data inside Kubernetes. You could use a Kubernetes operator to facilitate the running data in Kubernetes and you have the benefits of uh, supporting multi-cloud and cross-cloud portability. And the operator uses a declarative API that reconciles uh, the actual state with the desired state, and it automates day two operations such as upgrade, um, backend restore, data migration, and so on. We can also use other tools uh, such as uh, Prometheus and Grafana for monitoring and so on. So there are common patterns and features used while running data in Kubernetes. 
typically uh, we will use a operator to facilitate that. And uh, there are things that we should consider while writing a operator. We should look at what kind of uh, configuration parameters we want to expose to the users. It's not necessarily the, the more the better because you know, there's a trade-off between flexibility and complex complexity. An operator should support upgrades, non-disruptive upgrades, and also should manage different versions of the CRDs. And it should also uh, support periodic operations like re-indexing, a backup restore. An operator uh, typically will use persistent volumes to store data, and the persistent volumes are typically provisioned by a CSI driver. CSI driver uh, basically allows the storage to be consumed by the containers running in Kubernetes. So that's all I'm going to cover for the um, DOK white paper. I'm going to hand it over to Alex to talk about the performance white paper. Thanks, Jing. Um, so the other thing that we wanted to um, that we wanted to share uh, as part of that uh, white paper is um, trying to get an understanding of how each of the different systems have um, pros and cons, and and they have different facilities and different optimizations where uh, they can optimize for availability or optimize for performance or optimize for consistency. And each of those different things affect each other in different ways, right? So um, systems which are optimized for the lowest latency might not be um, suitable for the highest throughput. And similarly, um, systems that are optimized for synchronous consistency and availability might have lower performance and vice versa. So. One of the things that we that we kind of decided was, after describing you know these different attributes and the different pros and cons between them, is we wanted to go into a bit more depth uh, into things like availability and, and performance. So we came up with a performance white paper, and Raphael is going to talk about our disaster recovery, cloud native disaster recovery, um, because some of the stuff is some of the stuff is complex and it's and it's layered throughout um, throughout the storage system. So, you know, we have in, 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 our, uh, in our white paper, we, we go through um, the, the definitions of some of the performance concepts, you know, so common concepts like how do you actually measure this and, and how do you do um, benchmarking of, of things like volumes and, and, and databases. Um, and more important than that, we, we kind of also defined um, a lot of the criteria to, to help uh, users avoid uh, a lot of the common pitfalls that, that, that people come across when they're, when they're measuring um, performance. So, you know, understanding the difference between operations or requests per second versus, you know, throughput or megabytes or gigabytes per second. Um, understanding the effects of the, the topology um, uh, and the data protection and data reduction and encryption and, and how that affects um, things like latency and, and concurrency. And also understanding how caching operates at so many layers in, in, a, in a cloud native stack, right? All the way from operating system layers to, to application layers. Um, and, and that impacts, you know, how you benchmark and what you're actually benchmarking. Um, and so one of the things, um, one, of, one of the most important takeaways was um, that, you know, it is actually incredibly hard to do apples for apples comparisons for any of these um, environments. So published results from, from, from vendors can, can actually be very difficult to, to evaluate. Um, and you actually just need to understand what, what your application objectives are when you're looking at these performance requirements and, and to run your own tests in your own environments with your own applications typically is, 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 is the best solution because um, you know, I, I've lost track of the number of times where I've seen, for example, a benchmark saying, oh, I've managed to get two gigabytes per second on this volume. And then, and then you realize that the volume is a fraction of the size of the system memory and actually all they've been testing is how fast their memory performance works. Um, so, so understanding these things in your environment with your sizing and your applications in, 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 in your types of uh, uh, server instances in the cloud or on-prem or whatever is, is the most important thing. And we try to help you do that. Um, and now I'm going to pass over to um, uh, Rafael to talk about disaster recovery. Thank you. 
Okay, so what can you find in, in the disaster recovery white paper? You can find an approach to disaster recovery, which we call cloud native disaster recovery, of course. And um, the message here is that it's an approach that you should know about. We don't claim that it's always the best approach or that you should use it uh, every time, but we think we should know it and consider it in the next time you design your disaster recovery procedure, procedures. And uh, so how does it compare to traditional disaster recovery? We prepared this, this table here to, to help with that comparison. So for example, um, the type of deployments that um, traditional uh, organizations use for disaster recovery are usually active-passive, in particular for stateful workloads. Uh, for cloud native disaster recovery, we want active active all the time. So every failure domain can receive rights. And by failure domains here, we mean a data center or a cloud region. Um, then wh what or who detects that there is a disaster and, and start the recovery procedure? In traditional disaster recovery, it's usually a human. So there is, a com there is a, maybe a, um, an outage. So a committee of people, um, you know, meet and after trying to resolve the problem, they decide that it's hard to resolve or it would take too long and they click the button of let's start a uh, recovery procedure. For, um, for uh, cloud native disaster recovery, we want that decision to be autonomous. So the system needs to realize that there's something wrong and will um, start the recovery by itself. And then for the execution of the recovery procedure itself, um, in traditional DR, what we see in many organizations is that it's a mix of uh, manual and automated tasks. If the organization is good, they probably have more ma automated tasks and otherwise more manual tasks, but it's always a mix. Instead for DR, uh, for cloud native DR, it must be fully automated. And then with regard to RTO and RPO, which are the main uh, metrics, for disaster recovery. RTO, just as a reminder, is what is the interval of time, how long is the interval of time that it takes for the uh, disaster, for the application to come back online when there is a disaster. And RPO is the extent of um, uh, transaction in time that we have lost, that we lose because of the disaster. So for traditional DR, for RTO, we, we have from zero to hours, again, depending on how good the automation is. For cloud native DR, we, the, the RTO is close to zero. Essentially, just a few seconds, uh, just the time for the health checks to realize that something is wrong and for the load balancer to swing the traffic automatically to the healthy uh, failure domains. And then for RPO, depending on the kind of storage replication that you have, it could be zero if you have synchronous replication or it could be hours uh, if you have backups, right? Scheduled backups. For cloud native, cloud -native disaster recovery, <clears throat> it's gonna be zero, exactly zero, if you use a strongly, strongly consistent um, middleware. And it's gonna be um, theoretically unbounded, but from a practical standpoint, uh, close to zero if you use eventual consistent uh, middleware. And then <clears throat> less technical and more on the organization side, the owners of the disaster recovery process traditionally are uh, the storage teams because they have the technology they, um, to replicate the storage and then um, even if conceptually the owner of the business continuity plan is the application owner, they always turn around to the storage team and ask, what SLA can you guarantee? And that's the, that's the SLA that the application inherits. Uh, instead, for Cloud Native DR, the owner of the um, <clears throat> disaster recovery uh, procedure is squarely the application team because they are the one that they are going to choose the um, middleware, the stateful middleware, and we don't rely anymore on the storage uh, team for that. And then, Implementing these um, architectures, what I've noticed is that traditionally we rely, like I said, on storage capabilities to build our disaster recovery procedures. So we have things like backup and restore or volume replications. 
But for cloud native disaster recovery, we rely more on networking capabilities. In particular, a good east-west communication between failure domains, and then which is needed for the middleware, the stateful middleware to coordinate. And then um, we rely on uh, a global load balancer, as <clears throat> a smart global load balancer that can um, that has L checks and can identify when a, when a failure domain is down. Okay, so with this premise, this is a little bit of the, the uh, content of the white paper. You will find some definitions, the CAP theorem, which is the theorem that determines a lot of this, what, what is possible in terms of behavior for distributed stateful workloads. And then uh, we have the, a description of the anatomy of, the, um, of most stateful applications, and then a description of the consensus protocols that people can choose, and finally some reference architectures. So just an example of some of this content, this is um, the anatomy of most of these stateful work, modern stateful workload or distributed stateful workloads. Um, if you look into them, <laughs> this is what I found out doing my research. If you look into them, you find out that they, they all are built on the concept of uh, shards and the concept of replicas. So shards are used to achieve the ability of being able to scale indefinitely, horizontally indefinitely, right? So shards can process requests in parallel because they, they break the data space into multiple shards or partitions. And then replicas instead help achieve uh, uh, the resilience, uh, right? So, so that if a failure domain goes down, we have a replica of the shard somewhere else and we can still uh, <coughs> process the requests. So what's interesting here to understand is, is that there are protocols to keep the shards and um, to keep the replicas in sync and the shard coordinated when that is needed. So for example, if you're doing a software selection and trying to decide which storage you want to pick, storage product you want to pick, one of the lens that you will use is disaster recovery. And looking at the uh, way of the, the, the protocols and the consensus protocols that they use to coordinate shards and replica gives you an immediate feeling of what the product can actually do. So these are as part of the summary of what uh, some of these modern state of workload um, use for, for that uh, purpose. And finally, we have some um, reference architecture. Here I just uh, showcasing one which is a stateful workload that is, is distributed. It's deployed on Kubernetes. It's distributed across three data center. We assume that this workload is uh, strongly consistent. So when the workload come, comes up, all the instances can communicate with each other and can decide how to, to distribute the replicas and, and the partitions. And they can do it because there is that east-west uh, channel or communication pathway um, that is that arrow, that yellow arrow uh, there where it says state sync. So as you can see, the synchronization doesn't happen at the volume layer, it happens at the application layer. And then in front of that, we may have a front-end application, we may have some load balancers, but in front of everything, there is a global load balancer that decides to which failure domain your traffic should go. And that must be a smart one where if we lose, for example, one of those data center, the global balancer realizes that and starts steering traffic to the healthy ones. Okay. So this summarizes what is in the DR white paper. Great. Thanks, Raffaele. Um, so I'm going to finish off, uh, I'm just going to finish off this with a very simple call to action. Um, we're looking to continually expand the community and we're looking for more and more inputs from people who have end users or problems or use cases that they would like to discuss. Um, we're also very keen to hear from uh, projects who might be interested in joining as sandbox uh, or, or incubation and on joining the CNCF. 
Um, and, and on that on that note, we we, we have um, lots of uh, presentations from uh, current projects and new projects, um, covering everything related to storage. And 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 just for the avoidance of that, you know, storage isn't just volumes, but it's also you know different file systems and object stores and key value stores and databases and message queues and, and, and anything else that can persist data. Um, we'd really, you know, as, as mentioned, we're working on a number of different documents. If you have expertise in this area or if you just an end user with, with, a, with an interesting use case, we'd love to hear from you and please feel free to, um, uh, to contribute to the drafts uh, or to join the, the, the calls for, for discussing these, these documents. Um, and we're also always looking for um, uh, additional roles in the tag. So if you're interested in working more with the CNCF and would like to, um, to have a, a tech lead role uh, in, in, in this function or, or even you know, eventually join as a coach or join the TOC, working with the tags are, are really good ways of doing that. And, and please consider, um, consider that as, as, a, as a role within the community. Um, and, and help contribute to the projects, help contribute to, to, to this uh, information. You know, we, we're, we do this through a, a, wide, con a, a wide, you know, selection of individual contributors and vendors and customers and, and, and users of, of the CNCF community. Um, and it's always better when, when, we, when we can crowdsource the information from as many people as possible. So we'd love to hear from you. Come join our calls. Um, and with that, I'll hand over for a couple of minutes of questions. And please don't be shy. Somebody stick your hand up and ask a question. Otherwise, we'll all sit here in silence and it will be very embarrassing. No questions. Okay. So you all get a couple of minutes back on this. There is one? Oh, fantastic. Um, I actually have one. Uh, I'm actually pretty loud. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, perhaps a misunderstanding. Um, my name is Wes Hayatin. I'm from Red Hat. Um, <laughs> hey, <laughs> Raphael. Um, the Cloud Native Disaster Recovery uh, white paper, is that meant to have uh, native kube disaster recovery built in like and, and to replace like third party disaster recovery for cloud native apps so it's it's a general concept that doesn't require kubernetes but we have in, in the paper we have some reference architecture on how you would build it on kubernetes mm -hmm. i think the most important concept there is we don't try to recover the clusters. We just worry about the applications running on the cluster, right? And uh, so it's the application that needs to be able to do the things that we have discussed. Okay. Um, did I answer the question? I, I think so. I might okay. come up afterward. All right. Oh, I think we have a question here in the front. I have, a, I have a question uh, regarding the Kubernetes storage uh, attributes. Uh, CSI was uh, stated as, as um, the protocol. Um, is that because the first version is uh, database related and it is um, related to block and, and, and file? Or is there also something coming for COSI? Is the copy, uh, uh, container object storage interface. The question is about COSI, the container object storage interface, right? Yeah, yeah, so that project right now is the uh, RFR stage. Uh, so you are, in are you interested in that project? You want to see where that's going? Is that, yeah. Uh, we, actually, we also need more contributors for that project. We are actually now waiting for more uh, vendors who has object storage to write drivers. Right now we just have one for Azure, but we'd like to have more. And we have uh, bi-weekly meetings. So, uh, right, so eventually of course the plan is to move that from alpha to beta, but we are not there yet, but 
uh, there are still meetings going on, there are contributors, but we do need more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there a work on data warehousing uh, in a cloud native manner? MapReduce or machine learning? Not currently, um, but that sounds like um, an interesting, an interesting uh, aspect to take. Um, we, t today we're focusing on the data on Kubernetes uh, uh, white paper, which includes a number of different um, cloud native use cases, but there's a strong focus on databases. Um, we would love to hear more uh, about things like uh, data warehousing and ma machine learning and those sort of, um, um, you know, Apache Spark and Hadoop and all those sort of things in, in Kubernetes too. We, we do actually have um, some sandbox projects that that work in that area and, and that um, um, uh, are working in that part of the ecosystem, um, and there should be recordings of those of those project uh, presentations uh, online. Um, but if you're interested in, in working on that or helping us work on that, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. I just want to add that. Um, so actually, the so we're working with the data on Kubernetes community on this white paper that I mentioned earlier. In the first version, we're focusing on databases, but in the data on Kubernetes community, they also have other use cases. There are actually a lot of people in that community working on machine learning, data analytics workload. So that's something maybe we could do in, maybe in the V2 of the paper. So I think we're slightly over time. Um, so thank you all for, uh, for joining our presentation and uh, we'll be around if anybody has any, any more questions. Thank you.